Thank you, Dennis. Um, great to be here. Yeah, the last few days are the board in town, and it's hard to like tell them that I'm going somewhere else. They're my 28 bosses, so I had to do what I needed to do. But it's good to uh, it's good to be out here, and it's it's good to be in standing where Dennis just stood. Back when I was at that seminary, I remember this is nothing about you. It's more about me. But uh, my boss at that time, Walt Kaiser, good friends of Bill. Pollard. Um, the story is he got a call one day from, um, I was the dean then, uh, from someone saying, we'd like you to come speak at our 25th anniversary of our church. And he said, I'm busy that weekend, um, so I can't come, but uh, how about if I send the dean? And uh, the person responded, okay, but I don't, we don't want anybody lower than the dean. Uh, to which he responded, believe me, <laughs> there is nobody lower than the dean. So, yeah. You feel like that as dean sometimes, so, so uh, you know, there are days, don't you, Dennis? But uh, that's not true with our inimitable dean, Dennis Dirks. Um, Dennis, thank you for uh, being so much a part of this uh, leadership of this conference, and certainly for the last 20 years as you uh, transition to a new role at the end of this year. We're excited to see what God has in store for you. And... Uh, my current foundation friends, we just had breakfast over here, Greg Forrester and Drew Cleveland, thank you uh, for making this possible, your generosity and the vision, uh, and please convey our deep appreciation to Mr. and Mrs. Kern as well uh, for making this possible. And for the, I, I know I've missed some of the speakers. Um, is Wayne Groom still here? Okay. Mr. Wayne uh, Dallas is here, and um, Stephen Grable, uh, Joe Marciello, um, and certainly Bill Pollard. I was just had a brief conversation. Bill was the, 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 the commencement speaker, I think, my final year at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And uh, I want to say uh, publicly about Bill Pollard. Certainly you know about his leadership at Service Master and in the Kingdom and, and many, many boards, BGA, Wheaton, and others. Uh, but uh, Bill uh, is also a great dad. And I say that having uh, come to know your son, Chip, very well. Chip is my peer, Chip Pollard, um, president of John Brown University in Salem Springs, Arkansas. And uh, Chip and his wife, Carrie, have become very dear to me and uh, my wife, Paula. And uh, Chip and Carrie lost a son accidentally this summer, 20 years old. And uh, we've had some very heart-wrenching conversations with each other about leadership and family and tragedies that befall us and sovereignty of God. So, um, Bill, we've been praying for you and for your extended family uh, during these last few months. I want you to, to know that. I want to thank also those who are the CEOs that are here and those from the marketplace. I truly believe that you've added so much of dimension to this conversation and uh, grateful that you have carved times out, out of your incredibly busy schedules to be here. We've got Kroll School of Business uh, uh, folks here, I think, that have been part of this conversation or some of the planning, and thank you as well. And, and certainly uh, Scott Ray and the work that you're doing even uh, beyond this conference and thinking about uh, uh, work and ethics and theological framework of that. It's been a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a delight to be part of this extended conversation. Uh, it's so important for us to have this conference, thinking biblically about work. And something about a, a, a work retreat seems somewhat oxymoronic uh, <laughs> to me, but I do believe we need to set aside time, thoughtful reflection with each other. And again, for those in the corporate world that have joined us, you have really seasoned this conversation in a very important way as we look to the future. And as we uh, have leadership in thinking theologically about the whole idea of work and vocation, and for you Talbot faculty, this is a, uh, a worthy investment. Uh, your influence, uh, you need to know and hear it from me again, is, is far beyond uh, what you might imagine as you teach and as you write because uh, the impact that you have made uh, over these many years on men and women, those in Christian leadership, those who are in um, pulpits not only across America but around the world, um, 
cultures are being impacted by your work. And uh, we have so much more to do and so much farther to go. And I want to tell you again how delighted I am to serve alongside you in this great enterprise of kingdom work that we are about. And I think also about not only your work with theological students, but the influence that you're having on our undergraduate students as well and helping them think theologically about what does it mean to be people uh, that embody the whole of the Christian life, which includes their work, and they don't separate that from the rest of their life. I grew up in a pastor's home. Never gave much thought to what the Bible says about work, growing up, nor did I ever remember hearing my father preach a sermon about work. I mean, he was a great man and loved people. In so much ways, I know he poured himself into those who uh, left the pews every Sunday to go to that Monday, Friday, uh, often drudgery in this blue collar town south of Boston with plumbers and electrician and fishermen and shipbuilders who came into the church every Sunday to be fed. So my, my whole theology of work growing up wasn't kind of nurtured out of a biblical framework. As a matter of fact, when I was getting out of graduate school, um, I was going through a little bit of a funk of like, what am I, like, what am I gonna do now? And so I, I wrote this poem, this, this really hackneyed verse, which um, was somewhat autobiographical but I had to stretch it a little bit in order to make it rhyme. I, I titled the poem, Gotta Go and Get a Job. Um, you know, and I had put it off for a long time, keep going back to school. It goes something like this, if I remember it correctly. Miss Lucas told me in second grade that in 10 years I'd graduate. I turned and my friend said to my friend Rob, all this is school just to get a job. Four years later in junior high, Mr. Towski said, you're a pretty good guy when you graduate from Valley Tech. What are you gonna do for your paycheck? I thought, heck, that's coming up in five years. I'll make a decision before my peers. I prayed and thought a doctor is what I'm gonna be. What I'm gonna be. I changed my mind next year in biology. I lost the calling when I got a C. Yeah. Well, 1980 came the big year. I got a cap and gown, but no career. Hello, college, put the job on hold. Four more years, I won't be too old. Had art appreciation with Dr. Gable, thought that won't put any food on the table. <laughs> so I majored in psych instead of lit, figured it's good, it's what uh, Bob Newhart did. Uh, but Freud and Erickson may have been adept, but both of them, they died in debt, and I would too at this slow pace, got a college loan and an empty briefcase. Well, I got the degree, which I think I like, but what do you do with a degree in psych? So no job and all this pressure on my head, I went to graduate school instead. My mom said, you can't get a job on your good looks, so I hid two more years behind my books. Well, finally it came my third cap and gown, but the job was nowhere to be found, so I shunned my thesis, threw away my MA, and I went and got a job at Chick-fil-A, <laughs> uh, which uh, is actually at a delicatessen, but <laughs> what rhymes with delicatessen? <laughs> uh, you know, it's a... Uh, a trite bit of doggerel, uh, which is not only bad poetry, but actually it's bad theology. Andy Mills was on our campus recently, uh, along with some others, and you were involved in some of those conversations on theology of work, and Andy, I've known from back in the days in, in, in Boston, and a successful CEO, but he said there are often two polarizing extremes when it comes to understanding work. One is, we have this very uh, utilitarian approach to work, you know, the means in which I am able to live my life, maybe somewhat reflective of my poem. The other is more of a, a veneration of work, a place which almost becomes our embodiment of life in an idolatrous way, which, to be honest with you, sometimes is my temptation. Uh, get into any conversation with someone, three questions in is that, is that question, so what do you do? And uh, maybe it's a guy thing, I don't know, but uh, uh, I oftentimes find myself wanting someone to ask me what I do so that I can tell them and then they'll equate somehow my worth with my position 
and that's sin. Um, we are oftentimes, as we've heard so powerfully over our faculty retreat with Dallas Willard, um, tending to lean more towards doing than being. And we need to focus more on who we are and who we are in Christ. In a recent book, Work, A Kingdom Perspective on Labor, Ben Witherington, uh, Gordon Conwell graduate, I might add, who's at Asbury Seminary, or he was, I don't know if he still is, uh, has this broad view of work as ministry. He says, work, whether it involves plumbing a sink or plumbing the depths of the cosmos in the hands of a Christian is ministry. And I hope some of you who are here as marketplace people, CEOs, are, are hearing that from us, that we value your work not because of the titles you hold or, or, or maybe uh, the, the people that are under your employ or the money that you might uh, be accumulating, but we value you because you're doing God's work. And you are as much a part of ministry as my dad was when he was in a pulpit every Sunday. One of the distinctive aspects of the educational mission of Biola is to emphasize our interdisciplinary and integrative impact we are educating students through a biblical framework to impact the world for Christ in whatever vocation or profession they are called to. And as a Christian university, we talk a lot about ministry, but we also are a Christian liberal arts university. And as such, we believe in the value of education in not only the competencies of our students to do what they feel God has called them to do, but the convictions of our students to think deeply and biblically about how their vocational calling fits into their framework of their Christian life. And the courage of all those, our students, that out of that competency and out of those convictions, they will take on some big challenges and live and lead boldly for the cause of Christ. J.I. Packer has something to say about work. Actually, J.I. Packer has something to say about everything. Um, <laughs> And often, usually, it's, all, it's always it's good, no, J.I. Packer, um, said ministry means service to other people and all work, it seems to me, is oriented to the welfare of other people directly or indirectly. And uh, those of you who are here from the marketplace and the rest of the faculty, Tal uh, Talbot faculty can eavesdrop, but I, wanna, I, I know from knowing many of your stories, that's what you do. In conversations with Philip Paul about serving others through his work with Dwayne Andrews about the way in which you live out your life as a Christian in the workplace. And I know you've been salt and light to the communities that God has called you to in your roles of leadership. And this is true for others as well. Vocation isn't about what I do, but what, what God does through me. I've heard that through John Kang, I've heard that through Doug Meese, I've heard that through others that are here today in our one-on-one -on -one conversations. Scholar Jean Vaith wrote that, that wrote that vocation is nothing less than the theology of the Christian life. God calls us to live out our faith in the world, in the ordinary seeming realms of the family, the workplace, and the culture, to love and serve our neighbors whom God brings to us in our everyday callings. And Talbot faculty as professors, and you do that well. And our challenge continually is not to be content with where we are, but our challenge really is to look deeply at our theological curriculum in light of the importance of these conversations and to think about what do we need to do to prepare this rising generation of pastors and Christian leaders to affect and impact culture through congregations. And there's such a, we were talking about this earlier during breath, there's such a public good, whether you're an evangelical or not, of, of it, pragmatically of, of these large churches in communities throughout the United States that are helping parishioners think biblically so that they, they, they contribute to their communities. Hardworking, honest, good families, lots of integrity, interpersonal skills. And we know that above all of that, that they're living lives to glorify God so that those don't know Christ will come to know him as their savior. So some of the questions, are we thinking through how pastors are prepared? And I know you've been talking about that these past few days. 
And I want also to say, and, and I don't want to sound smug in saying this, but others are watching us. Biola and the work that we're doing through Talbot School of Theology is on the radar screen of many schools and many organizations, and, and they're asking how does an institution that has maintained these strong biblical convictions that the founders envisioned now in our second century, how are they gonna maintain that in an ever-changing world? And this is where we are going to be, I believe, the best of both. The best of the convictions of maintaining who we are, but the best of thinking boldly and creatively and being relevant, um, relative, maybe not so much rele relevant, which is the one I'm looking for, being relevant, not relative. Um, yeah, you don't want to be that. <laughs> it doesn't really work on the truth thing. Yeah. But there are many watching, and uh, we need to be bold, we need to be innovative, leading, and modeling biblical fidelity, affecting change in culture. Much of that happens through your work. So let's continue to seriously grapple with these questions, not only in your role in teaching seminarians, but also in your role in the 4100 undergraduates about how to think biblically and act biblically in whatever God has called them to. This is discipleship work that we're in. This is fulfilling that mandate of going and making disciples, and this is uh, what our uh, students need to understand, whatever vocations that they're going into. And when we speak of uh, theology of vocation, I think we also need to think in terms of excellence. Now, one way of looking at our work as ministry is simply by seeing it as an opportunity to excel, to do our very best to produce the most excellent things that we can produce and to work as hard as we can. But there's something about excellence in mirroring our creator that God has called us to as well. Last week I spent a few days in New York City, um, which in some, in some ways was, was a powerful time where we looked at Christianity and the arts, about 30 friends of Biola, as, as we approached actually that 9-11 uh, moment. We didn't spend a whole lot of time in museums, but we spent lots of time talking to artists, to Christians, to thinkers, to those who are engaged in a creative work. And I, and I thought, you know, they are artists, but, but you are too. We saw galleries, but what impressed me more was seeing studios. The kind of the messy place where imagination and hard work and tools of vocation and no real audience watching, all of that happens. The gallery is really squeaky clean with the right lighting and the right display of the artwork, but it's a studio where the real work happens. And oftentimes I think about that that place in our life where, 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 where work and creativity becomes beautiful in that crucible in which toil and imagination are fused by the worker, the artist, and good work is a reflection of the glory of God. There is an art in all of work in that we are called to create in our work that which is good, that which is transcendent, that which is reminiscent of the beginning of our creator. Surgeons are artists, as are accountants, teachers are artists, car mechanics are artists. And when you think about this within your calling of the Christian life, how we can honor God and serve others by doing what we do with excellence, it makes the heart of God glad. In speaking uh, at the Center for Faith and Work at his church, Redeemer Presbyterian pastor Tim Keller said this, we seek to help believers think out the implications of the gospel for art, business, government, media, entertainment, scholarship. We teach that excellence in work is a crucial means to gain credibility for our faith. If our work is shoddy, our verbal witness only leads listeners to despise our beliefs. If Christians live in major cultural centers and simply do their work in an excellent but distinctive manner, it will ultimately produce a different kind of culture than the one in which we now live. Seen this way, work is not a secular activity, but a sacred calling created by God. And so as one scholar writes, it must be undertaking, undertaken as a holy trust. 
And part of why we should aim for excellence in whatever we do, whatever I do, and I th- believe this is true, is because the work we do now is not just temporal or purposeless, but it has eschatological implications. What we do in the now has significant implications for the not yet world. Christian work, Witherington argues, is any necessary and meaningful task that God calls and gifts a person to do, and which can be undertaken to the glory of God and for the edification and aid of human beings, being inspired by the Spirit and foreshadowing the realities of the new creation. Miroslav Volf talked about this also in his book, Work of the Spirit Towards a Theology of Work. As educators here at Biola, we play an important role by instilling in our students the notion that their work is part of God's larger mission in the world, that their contributions to the flourishing of mankind offer important glimpses of the ultimate renewal and restoration of creation. As professors at Biola and Talbot, your job is not just to give students knowledge so that they can get a job and make money, which is the theme of that opening poem, but what you do is more important than that. You are teaching students that a job of vocation is not just a material necessity or means to an end. It's not just a secular activity we do five days a week so we can afford to do more important things on the evenings or weekends. But neither is it an embodiment of who we are. When I met with you last month at our faculty conference, I shared with you my own struggles with work, saying that there are times, which I regretfully admit, that I feel like I'm living for Biola, and I wake up in the middle of the night with Biola on my mind, and I don't wake up enough with Jesus on my mind. I don't want to live for Biola, I want to live for Christ. Uh, And part of the way in which I live for Christ is live faithfully in what God has called me to do in my vocation. I have learned, and I'm still learning, to to be obsessed with my own vocational accomplishments, uh, to consume kind of myself and who I am, or to be obsessed with my own inadequacies. Both of those are sin. They're both sand, and I wrestle with them. Sometimes I wonder if the best way to approach our work is to think about what happens when our life in that world of vocation is done. And what do I want to reflect on at that point in my life? I'm 49, so I'm not really ready to retire yet, but I have thought about that this summer and I've journaled about it. Four things came to mind as I think about, like, what do I, like, when I'm done, and, and I hope and pray that this is the last job that I have, that what do I want to say when I'm done? And I've thought of four things. One is I want to be most concerned when I think about what people are going to say about me, that I'm most concerned about what my family says my wife and our children. What are they gonna say about me when I'm done? Secondly, I wanna make sure that the place where I was, I'm leaving a healthy and not a hollow place. That I have held in trust what God has given to me so that the next generation of leadership inherits some place that is healthy and strong and not empty and shallow. Third, I wanna be able to look back and say, there are people that I've invested in. There are gonna be new programs and new buildings and campus expansion and lots of developments, but when Paul thought about this, he looked back and he said, he could identify the people, he called them my joy and my crown. Who will I say are those people that I've invested in, that I've mentored, that I've poured my life into? The same way that the, the Bob Cooleys and the Walt Kaisers and the Hugh Coreys have poured their life into me. Who will I say are my joy and my crown? And finally, when I leave that job, my hope and prayer is that I don't go through a spiritual depression, that somehow I seduced myself into believing that this was my life in Christ and that I don't feel empty when I leave, but I still feel a full vibrancy of who I am as a follower of Christ. And there's not that spiritual letdown that somehow I had mistaken along the way that my job 
was my faith. Theology of work provides us with an understanding that careers for Christians are a sacred trust, a sacred calling. It's part of our mission. It's a way we bring the values of the kingdom of God to bear on everyday lives and in our everyday spheres of influence. And as we reflect on what we've heard during the past few days from Wayne and Dallas and Bill and Stephen and others who have spoken, I urge you to think about how to apply this in your own classrooms as you shape the lives of the next generation? How can we best convey the biblical values of integrating faith, our Christian life with learning and vocation? What a great contribution you can make to society and to the church by helping students think biblically about their work. And for the seminary students you teach to help them think about the people that they will minister who live in the world of work for a third or more of their daily lives during the week. We have a theology of kind of the family, you know, the, there's theology of, of, of play and, and, and recreation, which is a third of our lives in many ways, and, but there's not enough thinking about a theology of work. Then the, the other third is a theology of sleep. I don't know if we need <laughs> some that think about that, I'm sure. How can we model a theology of work in our lives and how can we teach it to others? How can we make Biola a place where ministry is something we all do or strive to do no matter what our vocational calling?